Prayer is a way of reaching beyond yourself to align yourself with who you were created to be. That's beautiful. But when we hear the shofar, we're doing something different. We're doing something, I don't know if it's deeper, but it's, it's a different movement of the soul. And there are two aspects of the shofar. And we see that in the davening, in the Jewish service, there are two sets of shofar blasts. One before the Amidah, the silent prayer after of Musaf, and one after the silent prayer. There are two sets. And really from the sages of Israel, it seems like there are two aspects to the, so, the shofar blast itself. It can be divided into two spirits. One is the spirit of coronation. God is the king. We are declaring that God is one, that God created everything, that all of us are his subjects. Celebration of the king. It's like we are announcing the king's arrival. But then there's another idea, another spirit to the shofar. And that's not our announcing the coming of the king, but it's actually our cry. Our cry before our father in heaven. Literally like, oh, <laughs> it's like a cry. That sound of the shofar is our cry. Now, those are two different spirits. One is almost a celebration. And Rosh Hashanah is one of the happiest holidays. I mean, when I was in yeshiva, it was literally hours of dancing, letting the king come in to the palace. And we are going to just welcome the king like it's just <laughs> party like it's 1999. The king is coming and we are there to celebrate. But that other side of the shofar that's a crying to our father in heaven, that's a totally other spirit. That's why one of the soundings of the shofar is called the standing shofar and the sitting shofar. One is a little bit more personal. One isn't us all coming together to declare God as king. One is, I'm declaring God as king in my life. But my life is broken. And so from this broken place, I'm calling out to God. And so I want to talk about that. You know, when you look at thousands of years of biblical history, we're guided to two characters that take us to the shofar and take us actually to Rosh Hashanah. The first one is Abraham. Abraham is the first person to stumble upon a shofar. It's not a shofar that he blasts, but it's the first shofar that he sees when the ram's horns get tangled into the bush as he's about to sacrifice Isaac. That's the first time we see a shofar in the Torah. And we're told on Rosh Hashanah at the very beginning of the prayers for the shofar, remember Abraham, remember the covenant, the binding of Isaac. That's what this sound of the shofar represents. So I want to I want to keep that in mind, and I want to put it in the back of our heads, and I want to go to the second character because the second character will actually really open up Abraham's story for us in a totally new way, I believe. And so the second character is Job, and this is an idea that I gleaned from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. So first, I want to learn the story together the story of Job. It's one of the most mysterious books in the Bible. And the sages of Israel tell us that the story of Job first is not meant to be read as a literal story of history, but more similar to a Midrash. It's giving over an idea. It's forcing us to think. It's forcing us through the story to pray that story to God. And so the right way to read the book of Job is not like a biography or an autobiography or a history book, but to read it like a prayer that we offer up to God. And so what I want to do now is I just want to give people a little bit of background. And I'm just going to read the first few verses of the book of Job. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to tie it all together because the sages of Israel tell us that this story happens on Rosh Hashanah. That's key. It's the only one of the stories of the prophets that happens on this holiday. So somehow this story is key for us to understand. And so chapter one, verse one, here's how the story goes. There was once a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, tamim, an upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. We're told Job is a tzaddik. 
He's a wonderful person, a member of this fellowship, a great man. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 ox, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. So I want you guys to know, in the Arugot farm now, we have about 110 sheep. It's a lot of sheep. It's a lot. It's a lot of work maintaining those sheep. For Job to have 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500, it's like those numbers are not really normal numbers. That in, uh, in ancient times, I don't think that's even sustainable. That is like a, the, the most powerful king of all of the Eastern world would have such a thing. So already it's like alluding, guys, don't take this story so literally. It's giving you astronomical numbers that how would they be able to feed in graze seven? It's just impossible. So that's the first hint that this story is something that's beyond the natural. We're learning something through this story. So we have a rich man, a blessed man, beautiful family, money, possessions. He's got it all. He's made it. He's living the American dream. Job, the righteous man. Okay, we continue. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day. And he would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So their family is beautiful. They're having meals together. They're living the dream. And so it was, the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and maybe cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. So Job not only took responsibility for himself, but he woke up with the Judean morning early in the morning and immediately gave sacrifices to God on his behalf and on behalf of all of his family, guarding them, blessing them, praying for them. A righteous man. Who could imagine a more beautiful picture? Isn't that really what we all want? Just let us live the life of Job. All of a sudden, there's a twist in the plot. So now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to here and from there, all around the earth and walking back and forth on it. And so that already is the first um, sign that we're talking about Rosh Hashanah. Because spiritually, we're told that Rosh Hashanah, the angels gather around God, and there's literally like a court on each one of us. We stand before the king, and we have angels that will represent our case. And they'll say, but Jeremy, he really meant well. And he didn't mean it when he did that. And that mistake that he did, no, but his intentions were very good. And look at this mitzvah that he did. And he did this really good. But then there's a prosecuting angel. And that prosecuting angel, that's really the only time in the Hebrew Bible where Satan really takes a role. And his role is the prosecuting angel. He's the one that judges us. And there's a courtroom and there's evidence. And these angels are going back and forth, just like what's happening here with Job. And so the Lord said to Satan, this is verse eight, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So God says, here's Job. It was as if I created this whole world just that Job would exist, a blessed man who blesses me, who lives in harmony with me. We have the greatest thing going on, me and Job. This is why I created the world. Satan says, nah, nope, sorry. Verse 9, Satan answers the Lord and says, Did Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Of course he loves you and blesses you and prays to you, God. You've given him everything. 
But now, let's put this to test. Stretch your hand out and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you and your face. Maybe Job is only doing what's good because he's getting the blessing. Maybe he's only blessing Israel because he wants to be blessed. So God says, no, I know his heart. It's not true. It's not true. He's true. He's authentic. He's serving God because he believes in God. And the Lord says, okay, behold, all that Job has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and the book of Job begins. And in short, the book of Job is one huge tragedy. Job loses everything. Loses his wife. He loses his wealth. He loses his children. He loses his health. All of the blessings that we saw at the beginning are all taken from him. And you see at the end of the book, a broken person, Job. Broken. And at that point, that's when we pray. Because all of us have so much brokenness in our hearts, brokenness in our lives, but brokenness. And all we want was to be good. All we wanted was to serve God. And then we look at Abraham, who is really just a mirror of Job at this point in his life. God says to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to bless you beyond measure. I'm going to guard you. You're going to have it all. Look at what Abraham says in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. God says, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. Your reward is exceedingly great. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? I have no child. Your blessings, what are they worth? All I want is to have a child and I have nothing. I don't want anything. All that I want is a child. And then God gives him Isaac. And where do we meet the shofar once again? When God says, all you wanted was Isaac? I'm asking you now. Will you sacrifice Isaac? And Abraham has to look forward and say, with all of the brokenness and all of his hopes and all of his dreams and the promise that he would be blessed with Isaac. Say, I'll give it up to you, God. And so when the moon is all but gone, at the beginning of the month, Rosh Hashanah, you can't even see the moon. All the other holidays, the moon is full. Here it's like just a tiny sliver, almost all gone. And it feels like we're lost. It's from that place, beyond ourselves, in our brokenness. From that place, we say, God, you are my king, no matter what. In every generation, we had to face struggles. The Jewish people went through something much worse than the binding of Isaac. Just 80 years ago, we lost it all to evil. It was as if the devil was unleashed on earth and he had free hand on the Jews of Europe. And we suffered just like Job. And at that point, everything that has happened to us happens for us. And we blow the shofar and we recommit and we say, God, from this broken place, no matter what the promise, no matter what the blessing, I'm not doing it for that. I love you. I love the good. I side with the truth. And you are the king of my life. I'm committed to the good because it's the good. And then we blow the shofar, making God king. And those two spirits, they exist in all of us. On one hand, God is the king and we'll celebrate in Jerusalem. But as long as the temple isn't built, 
And as long as our fellowship is scattered around the world and not dancing together in Jerusalem, as long as evil still exists in the world, we have a place inside us that's broken, outside of us and inside of us. But from that broken place, it offers us an opportunity to really make God our king, no strings attached, pure, authentic service of the good, because that's what Rosh Hashanah is really about.